personal consideration paid for by the following. Hello and welcome once again to another retro review from Cheap Shot Entertainment. I am your host Luke, you are the Cheap Shot Nation and we're going through the year 2002 and this pay-per-view is probably one of the best of the year. It is SummerSlam, brought to you by World Wrestling Entertainment uh, on the 25th of August 2002. It is a joint Raw and Smackdown branded pay-per-view. Of course, they had split pay-per-views at this point in time. And uh, it comes to you from Uniondale, New York, from the Nassau Veterans Memorial Coliseum uh, in New York, uh, in front of 14,797 Sold out capacity uh, WWE fans. Uh, of course, it is on the network on demand. It is around three hours running time. And the theme song for this is Fight, uh, which is a WWE production theme, um, which is really cool because it is a really good song and it does fit this pay per view really well with some of the matches that are on the card of course the main event is the rock capturing the uh, championship the undisputed championship at the last pay-per-view versus brock lesnar who won the king of the ring to get his chance at SummerSlam. when king of the ring meant something and there was something to be had from it rather than just a crown and uh, that's about it. As usual, we're going to tell you what games this pay-per-view arena play, uh, appeared on. It was WWE 2K15. WWE Smackdown Here Comes the Pain. WWE Raw 2. And WWE WrestleMania 19. A great game for the GameCube. Uh, where there's um, Vince McMahon trying to take over the world. Fantastic. I'm going to have to play through that at some point, uh, but it does mean me plugging in my GameCube. Um, so that might not happen for a little while, but I will play that on Cheap Shot Entertainment System at some point. Just that mode is great. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> we're going to go through all of the matches, but before we go into the main part of the uh, the review for Cheap Shot Entertainment. I'm just going to go through the result of the Sunday Night Heat match, which was Spike Dudley defeating Stephen Richards uh, in the pre-show. But what would basically be the pre-show and continue to be the pre-show um, for quite some time, actually. Uh, anyway, um, looking forward to this one. I uh, hope you're enjoying the review. Uh, sit back, relax. And drink it all in. Or, as Chris Jericho would say, drink it in, man. And woman. And non-binary persons. Uh, because it's 2022 now. And we need to include everybody. Because everybody matters. Anyway. Um, join the community. Go on to the social media sites. Click the like and subscribe buttons. If you so wish to do so. And join us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook for all of your updates. I'm only doing retro reviews now on Cheap Shot Entertainment as well as the very few uh, shows that I do get to go to that I'm not actually appearing on. So, um, yeah, so there's not very many um, actual live wrestling shows that I do reviews of. But, um, yeah, you will have seen um, beginning of this month... And still available, of course, the review of Future um, from the end of July. Anyway, let's go to the main part of the video without further ado and uh, enjoy. So the first match of the card is an absolute doozy. It is, in fact, Rey Mysterio versus Kurt Angle 
in a just a straightforward grudge match type situation. Uh, Rey Mysterio has been costing Kurt Angle matches um, for quite some time. Uh, Kurt Angle has been returning the favour and it is a classic uh, technical grappler versus a high flyer. Both these guys absolutely astonish me. The, they still put on, they always do put on a great match. And wow, what an opener. Two main eventers, because certainly Kurt Angle was a main eventer at this point. Rey Mysterio was an absolute attraction piece when he came through to SmackDown for WWE. And uh, yeah, they put on a really good show. The crowd were really hot for this one straight off the bat. They they are absolutely uh, on top of uh, Kurt Angle with the You Suck chance. They're well behind um, Kurt Ang uh, well behind Rey Mysterio as well, uh, giving him all the cheer and praise. Uh, Rey Mysterio comes from behind. Ha! <laughs> Uh, at the opening of this match, Kurt Angle makes his entrance, waiting for Rey Mysterio. Kurt Angle pops up from behind, does the double drop kick into the ropes, goes for an early 619. Kurt Angle manages to steal out of the way and drag Rey Mysterio onto the floor. Uh, looked like he had actually ripped his leg off here. It was that forceful. Um, just proving how great both of these guys are. Uh, Kurt Angle from there would go onto the onto the front foot, go on the attack, um, wearing down the leg and the ankle of Rey Mysterio. Obviously, taking out the flying game of, of Rey Mysterio would be a great thing. And if he doesn't have his legs, he can't do the jumpy stuff, and he also cannot do the six one nine. So, great attention to detail here. Um, towards the end of the match, Rey Mysterio is looking like he's on top. He's getting ready to do a hurricane runner from the top rope. And Kurt Angle reverses it beautifully, drops down onto his feet. Rey Mysterio is prone on his stomach and Kurt Angle picks the ankle, locks in the ankle lock. Rey Mysterio desperately, desperately trying to get to that bottom rope. Kurt Angle... Being the bigger man, drags Rey Mysterio into the centre of the ring, really cranks on that Kurt Angle ankle lock, and Rey Mysterio eventually has to give in and tap. The crowd were absolutely electric for the finish. Uh, a lot of people going for Rey Mysterio, very much split down the middle. A lot of people cheering Kurt Angle as well at this point in time because... You know, he, he's Kurt Angle and he is getting that sort of stature uh, by this point in the year of 2002. And he always has had that stature uh, right from the off, whether it's been, you know, heel or, or face. I don't think he's actually been face at this point, but it would come um, in, in years uh, following this. But I'm going to give this one a very solid... Four cheap shots out of five because I really, really enjoyed this match. I uh, think it's probably the best opener to a pay per view I've seen for a very, very long time. And, uh, and what a great way to start SummerSlam! Fantastic. The bar has been set, and you could tell these two are like, hold on a second, we should be higher up the card. Someone's got to go first. They've been put on first, and they're like, right, let's put on a clinic. And that's exactly what they did. Brilliant, absolutely fantastic opening to this one. We next get Stephanie McMahon walking down the corridor with some random person from the backstage telling them how great Smackdown is, going into the general manager's office, which is also occupied by the raw general manager, Eric Bischoff. Uh, I guess they're going to have to watch this show together and uh, more play off uh, to who is the better general manager at this point and uh, yeah it's really difficult to say I mean Stephen McMahon is awesome Eric Bischoff still has his thing at this point in time as well both go on the attack of each other's brands and uh, they uh, yeah settle down to watch the rest of the show 
So the next match would feature Ric Flair, woo, who incidentally has just had, at the time of watching this, his last match in Nashville. Um, on the same day, incidentally, uh, no, on the same weekend, rather, as SummerSlam 2022. So 20 years in the past, Ric Flair is, has come in to the company um, once again as co-owner. He's now not co-owner. He then started performing again, which was really cool. Uh, bearing in mind he was 52 at that point in time, he's 73 at the time of his last match. And it's well worth a watch, his last match. It's uh, obviously it's a very special occasion, but uh, obviously don't expect too much out of uh, a 73 year old who's been in a hospital bed several times in the last couple of years due to different things. But lo and behold, he did it and he got through a 20 minute match and it was quite impressive. So if I can do that at 73 years old, if I get to 73, then I would be very happy. Um, I could, I'd be happy doing that at, at, uh, at 39, to be honest, which is what age I'm at now. Um, but anyway, we're on to this match. Chris Jericho is his challenger, and uh, there's been some animosity between these two. Um, Jericho attacking... Um, Ric Flair uh, and making him bleed Jericho then having a concert with Fozzy on Raw uh, Ric Flair would come and take out the equipment and uh, get his revenge on Chris Jericho and that would ultimately set up the match that we're going to see um, so obviously it is a Decent match. It is Chris Jericho versus Ric Flair, both at the height of their careers. Uh, I say the height of the career. Chris Jericho was at the height of his career, um, and Ric Flair was in the twilight of his career, going on to uh, possibly, you know, going on to better things uh, as well. Um, but yeah, he was still really impressive at fifty-two years old. So, you know, my kudos and my hat goes off to him. Um, but yeah, it's a really good match. Obviously, both guys, there's a bit of a feeling out process at the start. Chris Jericho is slightly stronger, being the younger one of the two. There's some collar and elbow tie-ups to get us going. There's plenty of slapping and plenty of woo chops going in as well on Chris Jericho's chest, lighting him up early on in the match. Um... So after after the feeling out process, Chris Jericho gets on top. He tries to finish off Ric Flair with his own finishing move. And we're going to the finishing sequence um, because Ric Flair manages to grab the middle rope. Charles Robinson is the referee, Mini Nate, um, who sees Ric Flair grab the middle rope whilst he's in the figure four leg lock and then tapping um something very similar happening on this year's summer slam as well um and yeah chris jericho thinks he's won and he obviously hasn't and rick flair comes back uh still selling the leg of course because he's rick flair and he knows how to uh, work a match and, and make it believable, and that's ultimately what you want out of a storytelling uh, match uh, like this one. He puts Chris Jericho in the real figure four leg lock, does all of his uh, wiggling up and down, because that adds extra pressure onto the leg, and Chris Jericho ultimately taps out and <laughs> Ric Flair gets the win. Uh, again, really, really good match. Um, one thing I didn't mention here, actually, is that uh, after a chop from Ric Flair, after breaking the figure four leg lock from Chris Jericho, after a chop, Chris Jericho wheels round and smacks Paul Charles Robinson in the face. And uh, he goes down. That gives Ric Flair a chance to uh, hit the low blow, uh, something he's very, very 
well known for. He even animated it into the games that he was in, uh, playing SmackDown vs. Raw at the moment. You can have it as one of your actual moves from a lockup, which is really cool. Um, so, yeah, it was a low blow, and that would take Chris Jericho down. That would lead to the figure four leg lock, and Chris Jericho tap it out. Chris Jericho writhing around on the floor, not very happy about what has happened, because he was trying to uh, do the same thing by pushing Charles Robinson out of the way uh, after the decision to not award him the win, as uh, Ric Flair would hold the rope and tap out at the same time. And, uh, yeah... We get the winner, which is Ric Flair, still selling the leg, still doing his uh, Ric Flair strut, even with the bad peg. And, uh, yeah, really good match. Really, really good match, uh, as you would expect from these two. I'm going to give this one, I'm not going to give it as much as the first match. Um, the reason being is that it didn't go quite as long, and for me it wasn't quite as exciting as the first match. But it was still very good. And and to say in the first two matches of SummerSlam 2002, we've had Kurt Angle, Rey Mysterio, Ric Flair and Chris Jericho, all world champions, in the first two matches of SummerSlam 2002, you know where this pay-per-view is going. Because it is started hot. Anyway, I'm going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five because of it not going quite as long, but it was still a fabulous match. Really, really good match. Really enjoyed it. Not enjoyed a pay-per-view like this, certainly in, in the 2002 retro reviews I've been doing for a long, long time. And uh, kudos to these guys. They've still got it. Back in 2002, Chris Jericho obviously still going, and Ric Flair having had his last match. It's a bit of nostalgia. Bit of, bit of goodness. We go into the back now. Chris, Jer uh, not Chris Jericho. Paul Heyman is with the next big thing. Brock Lesnar telling him that he is almost a champion. He's going to come away with the title being the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. Telling him that it's not like Hulk Hogan. He's he's like he's bringing out a. Uh, an old school record, uh, the best of Hulkamania, because Brock Lesnar ended Hulkamania. Not quite, but made him bleed uh, convincingly um, with a bear hug and, and uh, beat Hulk Hogan to, uh, yeah, it was just awesome, basically. Um, <clears throat> so... <clears throat> Yeah, Paul Heyman's telling Brock Lesnar that uh, The Rock will come at, at him with everything. He's the people's champion. He's the Brahma Bull. He will almost feel like the challenger in this match because Brock Lesnar is the man. And he gives a wry smile while he's bouncing up and down. Brock Lesnar looked like an absolute beast. Uh, a different kind of beast in 2002, of course. Looks like a beast now, but he looked really good in 2002 and they built him up to be that good uh, and he was uh, he really really was so i'm looking forward to the main event of SummerSlam 2002 but we move on to the next match moving on to the next match it is eddie guerrero versus edge in what would be a sort of battle of the mid carders here uh, both very much high flyers, but still way above that uh, cruiserweight limit. Um, some things before the match. Uh, obviously, Guerrero was very much the heel. Uh, both guys would make would have the most success in their opposite roles, with Edge being heel and Guerrero being face. Um, and they were part of SmackDown. Obviously, this was... A door branded pay per view. Um, so the match starts with some brawling. Edge gets the upper hand early on. Um, he ties Eddie Guerrero up in the ropes, tries for the spear, 
gets it once. Eddie's not quite tied up in the ropes properly. Uh, goes for it again. Goes for the well one too many times. Eddie gets out, ducks out of the way. Ed takes a nasty spill to the outside. Lands on his arm. Starts selling the injury. Eddie Guerrero can smell blood. Uh, the referee pushes him away to start with, but then he just goes straight in like a rabid animal, throws Edge into the steps, and that begins the heat. Um, from here, Eddie Guerrero would just take out the arm of Edge with the thought that with his two finishing moves, one being the Impaler DDT, where he has to grab them and, and chuck them up and, and DDT them, and the other one being a spear, if take the arm out, then there's genuine uh, malice there. There's, there's something there that means that Edge can't possibly win. Uh, and therefore, it just sells the whole story uh, to you as a fan as well. Um, so, it wouldn't be till the end. Eddie Guerrero going for some high-flying frog splashes and lucha moves where Edge would start gaining the upper hand again. Um, Eddie Guerrero going close a couple of times with the near falls, goes for the frog, frog splash, Edge gets his knees up, which ultimately leads to a finish where Eddie Guerrero does manage to get back up, he, he uh, goes for the top rope uh, Hurricane Runner uh, as he's walking across the ropes with the hand clutched, um, Edge counters that, Eddie goes careening into the ring, Edge bounces off the ropes, hits the spear with the good good arm, and we have the one, two, three finish. Um, so, yeah, I think this one, it, it's short and sweet. I like it. Um, it was very good. Um, I'm going to give this one, again, three cheap shots out of five. Um, it told a very good story. It was a very competitive match. Um, you know, Edge... Managed to pin uh, Eddie Guerrero with a spear, which is a good sell of his finishing move. Um, he couldn't have done the spear with the other shoulder because of the injury. And Eddie Guerrero, you know, loses another match. But he goes on to bigger and better things, and so does Edge. Um, and this feud is definitely not over. And these two remain the future of SmackDown at, at this point in time, in 2002. Um, we uh, go to the Un-Americans, which is Christian and Lance Storm and Test, uh, and they do an interview with Jonathan Coachman, and they rip the fans of the USA um, and, and for not appreciating them and how they are world-class level. Uh, the challengers in this match, which is the next match up, are Booker T and Goldust. Absolutely brilliant. Love Booker T and Goldust individually and both as a tag team as well. Uh, they enter the tag team title picture um, with Christian and Lance Storm representing the champs um, and swinging the upside down uh, old glory, uh, of course, because there they are on Americans. So why not? Uh, JR noted uh, the universal symbol of distress, having your flag upside down. Don't know how that would work for the Union Jack, because it's the same backwards as it is forwards and upside down as it is straight up. So, who knows? <laughs> you just fold it in half, I don't know. Um, but we'll move on to that match next. So moving on to the next match, it is for the WWE Tag Team Championships. It is Christian and Lance Storm versus Booker T and Goldust. Of course, the Un-Americans carrying the flag upside down um, when uh, that means it's the universal sign of distress. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a, a mediocre with this one. Um Golda starts it off with a hip attack on Christian and a power slam uh, on Storm. Uh, Storm then gets tagged in and Goldust is hit with uh, an atomic drop. Um, so, yeah, the basically in this one, um, there's a lot of double teaming on Goldust, um, a lot of heat 
on Gold Dust. Booker T does eventually get the hot tag. Uh, with that, the referee does go down. Lance Storm tries to use the title belt. He gets taken out by the double team from Gold Dust and Booker T. This gives enough time with the referee down for Tess to come out of the crowd and hit the big boot to give the Un Americans the win. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's mediocre at best. I'm going to give it, it's, it's a fun match. It serves its purpose. Um, you know, dastardly heel ways and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it, uh, for me, it's probably a two, maybe two and a half cheap shots out of five if I'm going to be nice to it. Uh, it does what it needs to do. It does what it says on the tin. It gets the, um, the, the bad guys, the heat, uh, and the sympathy vote goes to the good guys. And uh, certainly in America, if you're against America, you're the worst thing in the world ever. Um, so at least they got that bit right. And if you're from a different country, that's it. You're a bad guy. Can't be good. Unless you're the bit of British Bulldog, but even he turned heel eventually. Anyway, um, so yeah, two and a half cheap shots out of five for that one. So there's not much to tell you about this match. It is certainly probably one of the weakest on the card. But that being said, it was still decent. You know, it's still watchable. It fills a gap. Before we go to the world in New York. So which WWE jobber is in WWE The World in New York? Well, it certainly seems to be that there's less jobbers in WWE The World New York now and more champions there because it is Jamie Noble and Nikita who are at The World in New York. And apparently there was a make-out contest. I mean, the winner gets to make out with Nidia. We join Jamie Noble and Nidia, who's Nidia, who is uh, accompanying the uh, Cruiserweight champion, which is a damn shame that he's at The World unless he's got a slight injury that I don't really know about um, because he's brilliant I don't know why he's not on the show um, but there you go so Nidia picks between two people uh, two guys uh, and starts making out with one of them while Jamie Noble gets the microphone and goes yeah yeah give him the time baby uh, you know all that kind of southern jazz so uh, yeah very classy segment for this one uh, yeah and, and then we move back to the arena uh, the NASA Coliseum to the GM's office and the reaction of Stephanie says everything here she's around about the 26 year old Mark and obviously still with trips um, at this point even though kayfabe uh, says they've got a divorce, divorce rather uh, Eric Bischoff, I mean, I've paused it here to do the uh, analysis of the last segment. And uh, the pause that I've managed to do is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's uh, you know, what are these guys watching on TV? <laughs> well, it's Nidia making out with a fan. Um, but yeah, then we uh, move on to Stephanie and Bischoff. Uh, Bischoff said that... Uh, Woman like Nidia knows her place in the business. Very 2002. Stephanie said the women in this business are like herself on top. They trash talked about Rob Van Dam and Chris Benoit uh, versus Chris Benoit, with Benoit being on SmackDown, uh, made his entrance into the next match first. Uh, and then uh, he jumped to SmackDown uh, for Rob Van Dam, got a much bigger ovation, and uh, he represented Raw. Um, so this match was made before the match, before Benoit moved to SmackDown with his good buddy Eddie Guerrero. Um, so, yeah, it's um, 
quite a different one this one is it's cross branded so there's a lot to have for both of these GMs in this match which we're going to move to next and it's for the Intercontinental Championship. So as promised, the next match is the Intercontinental Championship match between Chris Benoit and Rob Van Dam. Most notably, bon Benoit, who is the heel champion at this point, had picked up the championship from RVD and then jumped ship to SmackDown. So that leads us to the Bischoff, Stephanie McMahon interactions in the back, uh, where Stephanie would... Uh, gloat that it would stay on SmackDown and Eric Bischoff would see that the Intercontinental Championship would go back to Raw. Um, so, yeah, we uh, get a very, very hard-hitting match from uh, two people who used to be in ECW, uh, know each other very, very well. Um, RVD opens up with kicks and a shoulder tackle. He does bust Chris Benoit open at the mouth. Uh, what I found really interesting about the entrance here is that they've actually blurred the WWF logo, of all things, in this match <laughs> on the championship. So you can't actually see the championship around Benoit's waist. Um, uh, just something... I noticed, and I thought it was quite funny. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, the this match, like I say, hard hitting. Um, Benoit with more hard hitting style, uh, RVD with the risk taking style, the uh, high flying, and all that kind of stuff. Um, Rob Van Dam would get the upper hand going into the early part of the match until he tries to. Um, Hit a split legged moonsault, which he does, gets uh, the knees up. Chris Benoit does. Uh, Rob Van Dam goes up again eventually and gets pushed to the outside, injures the arm. Of course, that plays into the crippler cross face, which is Benoit's finishing maneuver in terms of uh, submissions. Um, so, yeah, he would get the um, crippler cross face on. Uh, which would lead to RVD using the educated feet to find the bottom rope and uh, the commentators making good note of this which you know is something that doesn't happen these days and they're telling you the story they're telling you oh look his arm's injured that's going to lead to this it's going to lead to that um, there isn't much of that anymore and I really appreciate the old school nature of if you've got an injury you sell it and your opponent goes for that injured limb. Um, something that I really liked in the SmackDown versus Raw games where you could work on a limb, you could really batter that limb, and then when it came to the actual finish, it would make a difference uh, when it came to the finish. Um, so, yeah, the, these two go back and forth again. Benoit uh, puts Rob Van Dam in another light suplex, which he uh, bridges from and uh, uh, hits a second Northern Light suplex. Benoit hits RVD with three Northern Light suplex in, suplexes in a row while hooking RVD's arm, which obviously would lead to Benoit slapping on the Chris Crippler cross face again, which RVD would break with back elbows this time. Uh, RVD would drop kick um, uh, Chris Benoit. RVD hit a springboard kick to the face of Chris Benoit and then he does a step over kick, uh, spinning heel kick. Van Damme goes up to the top um, and hits the five-star frog splash, twisting in midair, which, as rightly said, on commentary is a huge athletic feat. Um, there's no better uh, five-star frog splash um there's no better frog splash in my opinion than rvd's um it's just it the impact that he, he lands it with it makes it look like it's just nasty to take you know um i've been under uh 
a, a move similar to that, only it wasn't off the top rope, it was just an elbow drop, and it never ceases to amaze me how they prepare themselves to take that impact. But we do get the finishing fall after the five-star frog splash. The Intercontinental Championship goes back to Raw with Rob Van Dam, and uh, the match went around 15 minutes, and it was very worthy of that 15 minutes because this was... Really, really good. I enjoyed this match. Like I say, two contrasting styles. Brilliant. Um, Going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five. Um, probably a match that gets forgotten about. I like a lot of these matches because of the Brock, Brock feud. Um, but it was given to RVD's put over. Um, and obviously Benoit put him over in a massive way with the brand split and the IC Championship going to Raw. Uh, like I say, really brilliant. Um, Benoit was a master uh, for all of his things that he did. Wrestling-wise, he was good. Um, and RVD helping with the selling of the arm. Like I said, I miss that kind of old-school stuff. Um, so, yeah, entertaining match. Um, and it... It um, was uh, a bit longer than the Ray Angle match, which is a shame, but because um, Ray and Angle <laughs> needed more time, uh, but it was still a good match and uh, very much worth a watch. We go back to the backstage now. Eric Bischoff is now celebrating the win with Raw. Uh, bringing the Intercontinental Championship back home. And he says, you can see the Intercontinental Championship, after stuttering a little bit, on Raw this coming Monday. Uh, it would happen to be in Madison Square Garden as well. Um, and uh, Stephen McMahon just looks mad at the loss, but then decides to laugh it off in a maniacal way, and walk out of the room. Um, and this would eventually lead to the SmackDown brand introducing the US Championship. Next up, we have the American Badass, The Undertaker, going against Test for the uh, pride of a nation. Obviously, the un-Americans flying the flag upside down, the universal sign of distress. The Undertaker, the American Badass, protecting his rights to bear arms, I mean, to ride motorcycles to the ring and wear leather trousers. Very obvious dynamic here. Test is the un-American uh, and he's the heel. And Undertaker is the American badass. He's just the Undertaker. Ge in general, that's, that's the way it is. Uh, obviously playing the good guy character. Um, so... We go into the match. Um, Test is trying to get the upper hand here. Doesn't really work. Um, the Undertaker comes back. His leaping clothesline takes Test out. Uh, Test um, is really trying to get the upper hand. The Undertaker takes takes him out again. Uh, looking for the old school. Uh, goes for it. Uh, hits it. Test... Um, or tries to hit it rather, Test pulls the referee into the ropes and that is where the heat comes in. The Undertaker is now down and seemingly out after taking the um, rope to the balls. And um, yeah, Test is on top. Now comes the heat. Uh, Test is grounding the Undertaker with all he can muster, strikes an armbar. Um, really just waiting for rest holds. Uh, the Undertaker hits a surprise uh, running DDT on test, gets two count. Uh, Taker ro walks ropes again and uh, that leading to the punch in the back. Taker sent test into the top turnbuckle. Uh, test ducks the big boot, snake eyes big boot combination and uh, the slam attempt didn't work. Taker landed on his feet. Test went for the big boot again. Uh, Taker avoided it and Taker hit a huge choke slam leading into a slow cover and a two count. Landstorm and Christian, of course, then come to the ring to aid their un American friend. 
and um, <clears throat> Taker uh, hits corner splashes on both guys. Uh, Test tries to come back in, tries to hit the big boot. He ducks it, choke slam to Christian, and uh, Test back. Yeah, I say Test back in at this point, obviously with the big boot uh, to the face for a two, and uh, he that was a decent near fall. Test brought in, but brings in a chair into the ring. Take a kick the chair and take a hits the tombstone on test for the finish. Now this one is sub 10 minutes. It's very regrettable and forgettable, sadly. Um, but it, it just filled a hole, really. Um, don't think they had much for Undertaker to do at this point, which is really sad because he should be in the title picture, but he wasn't. Um, so he's defending America. Um, so it was good to have uh, Taker out of the picture for a little while because obviously he'd come back into it and and be absolutely dominant. But I'm not going to give this a great rating. I mean, it was serviceable. It had a very predictable outcome. And um, I'm going to give this two cheap shots out of five uh, simply because the uh, you know the crowd... Didn't really care very much until the Undertaker flew flew the uh, old glory flag uh, behind him, um, and yeah, they didn't really respond to much going off in the match. So moving on now to the unsanctioned street fight with an unsanctioned referee, unsanctioned pyro, and unsanctioned confetti. Um, <clears throat> also has un unsanctioned music and unsanctioned entrances. And an unsanctioned bin. Um, but yeah, this match drew a lot of anticipation. It was an example of a story told brilliantly. It wasn't told over many years. Uh, but then again, I suppose it was. I mean, it was four years in the making. It, it was just insane. Uh, before this, the last match that Shawn Michaels had had was on WrestleMania Uh 15? Want to say 15? Um, yeah, because 16 was 2000, wasn't it? Yeah, so uh, no, it was WrestleMania 14, in fact, then, because it was 1998. Um, and yeah, of course, because 15 was Rock, Rock Stone Cold 1. Um, and uh, yeah, this uh, had all the hallmarks of two former best friends who had, you know, fallen and parted ways uh, since making the D-Generation X stable back in 1997. Triple H obviously moved on, made the stable bigger, um, and eventually it would fizzle out around about the 2000s when Hunter got his main event push. So, yeah, these two, um, best mates, bitter enemies. Um, the promo package that they put together was absolutely fantastic. Obviously, the lead up to this was Shawn Michaels coming back, Triple H saying, Yay, my best friend's back, and then attacking Shawn Michaels in the parking lot when security footage was released. It was unscrambled, and there he was, Triple H standing there with his hair slicked back and, and in a ponytail. Um, you could tell <laughs> from the security footage that was blurred that it was Triple H. But back in the day, that was a big reveal. And this match, like I said before, was is probably one of my favourite SummerSlam matches ever. Um, it's got hardcore elements in it, but it is just a scrap. And they know how to pull that off. Um Shawn Michaels getting the upper hand after the entrances, um, really taking it to Triple H, even bringing out a, a bin from under the ring, because everybody knows you can't set up a ring without a bin. Um, and uh, at that point, it would be uh, Triple H that would take over. Shawn Michaels would uh, throw the main part of the bin in the ring, take the lid, and try and use it on Triple H, that would not work. 
uh, Triple H would drop Shawn Michaels over the barrier, but it wouldn't be long before Shawn Michaels uh, came back again. Um, he wanted to hit super kick. Hunter avoided the super kick, and uh, we continue Hunter uh, leading to Michaels going back first into the corner, um, really selling the back. Obviously, that is the reason that he retired from a broken back. Um, Hunter comes back with the knee and the face buster um, and then a DDT on the chair which leads to a two count and Shawn Michaels being busted open. Uh, Hunter brings out his trademark sledgehammer from under the ring. At this point Earl Hebner oversteps his mark. Obviously he's got a referee um, and he's there to count the one, two, three because it's an unsanctioned pinfall of course. And uh, yeah, it is a case of um, Shawn Michaels um, stopping the hammer being used. Uh, sorry, Earl Hebner stopping the hammer being used. And uh, the match sort of continues. And uh, you know, Earl Hebner being pushed out of the way. Sh uh, Triple H going back. A bit of a shoving match here between Hunter and, and Earl Hebner. Of course, because um, quite frankly, Shawn Michaels would eventually hit the elbow drop from the ladder. Crazy, crazy move. Um, he popped back up. The uh, crowd were really sort of worrying about Shawn Michaels before he did this. Shawn Michaels goes for the sweet chin music again after Hunter had used the chair multiple times for backbreakers. And uh, he um triple h counters this uh goes for the um pedigree Shawn michaels drops rolls over and uh goes for the roll up and the win a uh, bit of a cheap win uh, because well you know it's exactly that but at nearly 30 minutes long this match was an absolute epic and it showed every bit of uh, professionalism that Shawn Michaels has had over the years. I'm going to give this match four and a half cheap shots out of five. Um, and the commentary, everything down from the commentary to the story being told, 25 years, never seen as much courage and will to win as Shawn Michaels, quoted from good old JR. Um, Really good match, and obviously this then would start a mini feud going into Survivor Series where we would see the first Elimination Chamber, which again is another one of my very favourite matches as well. So the next match is the main event match between The Rock and the next big thing, Brock Lesnar, who of course won the right to face The Rock at SummerSlam by winning the King of the Ring when that meant something. The Rock picked up the championship from The Undertaker in a triple threat match at Vengeance and so we get Rock Brock. Um, Lesnar's been on a tear. Rock, it was round about the time when the internet started becoming huge and spoiling things so people knew that the rock was leaving for hollywood and uh, yeah it's bizarro world um obviously the rock's no stranger stranger to being booed or being told that he sucks but at this point in time he was definitely the face and brock was the heel um it's bizarre doesn't pull away from the um it doesn't at all pull away from the match uh rock was 35 at the time lesnar was 25 insane to think that rock had been in the wwf for that long at this point um you know it was i think he's around about six years ish uh since he'd made his debut at, at survivor series um, and uh, yeah, he had what was a Hall of Fame career in the space of that first six months. Obviously, he would at uh, first six months, first, first six years, he would come back. Obviously, um, and uh, you know, 
do do his thing. Um, and uh, yeah, Brock Lesnar would come down to the ring with Paul Heyman, being one of his first agents in WWE. Um, the Rock runs down to the ring. Brock is already in the ring. Uh, runs down to the ring. Opens up with the uh, strikes. Brock Lesnar quickly cuts this off into a belly-to-belly -belly suplex, and you knew where this one was going uh, from there. The fans, again, like I say, bizarro world, chanting Rocky sucks um, as uh, Brock just laid into the Rock uh, and uh, knocks the Rock out of the ring. Uh, Rock sent over the barricade. Lesnar did a press slam into the barricade uh, and he's met and followed up with a another clothesline uh, Mike Kyoda wasn't counting obviously at this point in time uh, the outside counts for championship matches were very loose um, and um, you know it, it made for better entertainment um, Brock Lesnar hits a spinning power slam um, after uh, this, uh, Lesnar with the shoulder tackles to the ribs in the corner, tries it one more time, Rocky moves out of the way, Rocky selling the ribs, or Lesnar now with an injured soldier, uh, sh soldier, shoulder, uh, Rock moves in on Lesnar and hit, uh, hits a uh, belly to back suplex, both guys go down, double down, and uh, the Brock kips up and so does Brock Lesnar as well. Pretty cool. Uh, the Rock uh, hits another two clotheslines and a DDT. Heyman gets up on the apron. Rock knocks him down uh, with a punch and then a leg whip. Uh, the Rock slapped on a sharpshooter uh, and it didn't look good. Uh, the fans now fully behind Lesnar. Um, Heyman is brought in, Heyman distracted the ref, Lesnar grabs a chair and uh, he hits the rock with it. Uh, Lesnar slapped on a bear hug which is uh, remnants of what he did to Hulk Hogan, killing Hulkamania apparently. Uh, and again, fans fully behind Lesnar on this one. Uh, Heyman got up on the apron again, the ref went to him and The Rock punched Lesnar in the low blow and uh, Lesnar drove The Rock into the turnbuckle again, shoulder tackles again, against the turnbuckle, Rock exploded out of the corner with a clothesline punches and a, a spit punch, um, something that you'd never see these days of course. Uh, the crowd's cheering um, when Lesnar hit another move on The Rock. Rock cleared the Spanish announce table and uh, closed line on Lesnar. Rock cat uh, with a catapult that sent Lesnar into the ring post. The ref was counting them out this time uh, with, um, with 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 a tank ten count. Uh, Rock picks up Heyman and gives him a rock bottom through the announce table, taking Heyman out of the equation. Uh, the chant of Rocky Stocks still comes in. And let's go Lesnar. Uh, rock Bottom is hit by The Rock. The Rock reacting to this perfectly. And uh, gets the two count. And the fans are going crazy about this. The Rock hits the spine buster. Uh, through his elbow pad. Goes to hit the people's elbow. And Lesnar pops up and takes him out again. Uh, the fans go crazy again. Fought out of the... Uh, Lesnar fights out of the rock bottom and hits an F5 for the win. Lesnar gets the cover and you have a new world champion. And he would be the youngest world champion until Randy Orton would win the championship uh, a few years later. Um, winner by pinfall is Brock Lesnar. His first championship in WWE. Uh, was the main championship and he was built up to be an absolute monster as he should have been a uh, very memorable match because the rookie beat the veteran um, and that's exactly what um, needed to happen and it made for uh, excitement um, there was the hardcore fans 
still with The Rock. Uh, but most people wanted to see Brock Lesnar win this one. Um, the crowd told a big story with this one as well. Like I say, with the internet becoming a big thing, people knew that Rock was going to Hollywood. And they wanted him to lose because of that. Because, you know, I want this person to do this because I said so. Anyway, <laughs> Lesnar celebrates in the middle of the ring. The broadcast ends and uh, that is the end of SummerSlam 2002. Um, so a bit of an epic review on this one. It's taken me quite a while to complete the watching of this one, analysis on this match. Uh, it was going to be a tough act to follow with the Shawn Michaels Triple H uh, match, but they did it very, very well. It was a really good match. I'm going to give it three and a half cheap shots out of five um, because of the constant in interference from uh, from Heyman. But that being said, it was again part of the storyline. The Rock took Heyman out and everything else, and it was a passing of the torch, so to speak. You know, to a younger generation. Um, overall, SummerSlam, fantastic. Um, the Long Island crowd was brilliant. Uh, really standout matches here are obviously the Shawn Michaels Triple H match. Um, and for me, the RVD Eddie Guerrero match as well. Um, the opening match between Rey Mysterio and Kurt Angle, why that wasn't f further up the card, I've no idea. Um, <clears throat> Again, it was going into a new era where The Rock was gone. Uh, Stone Cold wasn't around as an active wrestler at this point. You had veterans such as Triple H obviously bringing Shawn Michaels back. He didn't know that he was going to wrestle again at this point, but he did. Um, you've obviously got a few other veterans on the roster as well, but it really was a case of this is... The way forward, we're moving into a new era of WWE and it would become the Ruthless Aggression Era. Um, and I quite like the Ruthless Aggression Era. Every era has its fans, every era has its problems, but I do quite like the Ruthless Aggression Era. Um, and I will stick by that because it was very, very good. You obviously got Kurt Angle as well, um, flying, flying the flag for the um, veterans and likes of uh, Ric Flair as well. And of course Big Show and, and Book T and Gold Dust. Anyway, um, really good. Really, really good pay-per-view. Possibly, maybe even the best pay-per-view of the year. Um, because of how it was. It was great. It was good from start to finish. The only thing I didn't mention here, because I went straight into this match, is that there was a little segment in between Shawn Michaels and Triple H and this match, where Finkel would come out and say, yeah, I'm great, and uh, Trish Stratus would come out and, and, and tease him, and then Lillian Garcia would come out and kick him in the balls. There's a reason I didn't mention that, because it was comedy at his worst, uh, it was designed to make Fink look stupid um, and a way to get the Divas women onto the card. Notably on this card, actually, there was no defending of the Women's Championship. Um, so, you know, it's it does take it down a little bit as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed the... Review of SummerSlam 20, uh, 2002, a full 20 years ago today on the release of this video and podcast. Um, so, yeah, a bit uh, bit nostalgic. We're still doing the retro reviews. That is retro with a W uh, because of wrestling, of course. And, uh, yeah, really, um, really enjoyable show. Like I say, notable absence of the Divas apart from that um, particular segment which is a shame so we move on 
to uh, Unforgiven next and uh, that is obviously the September pay-per-view in uh, uh, taking place at the hold on a second uh, Staples Centre in Los Angeles uh, on the 22nd of September and uh, yeah that's that hope you've enjoyed the video slash podcast and uh, if you would like to and I would love it if you would uh, leave us a like and subscribe to the channel and the podcast because there's more retro reviews coming um, but you are the cheap shot nation and I will leave you there thank you very much for joining us and I'll see you next time goodbye Hiya!